Good afternoon. I'm Andy Walker, not Dario Cantu, who's, who's uh, abrogated his duties to me for the day, to introduce Dave Hugh. And Dave's been a student with me for a while, uh, about a year, I guess, finishing up his master's now in the second year, working on chloride exclusion. And he's one of the few students we can actually say was proud to be born and raised in Milwaukee, Minnesota, or, <laughs> well, whoa, that's a big Florida slip, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, um, and um, actually wants to go back to the Midwest and have a vineyard there someday. So we clearly have not knocked some sense into him quite yet, but we will over time. So Dave, uh, good to have you here today and um, take it away. Thanks, Andy. Try this once more. You got it. Mostly got it, huh? I had it up just a second ago. It worked beautifully. Oh, here we go. Okay. Okay. You're ready. <clears throat> Welcome again. Take it away. All right. So for the last several decades, the Walker Lab rootstock breeding program has been collecting North American grapevine uh, material from around the southwestern United States, the western United States, and Mexico. And we've collected hundreds, if not thousands, of cuttings. And we've brought them back to UC Davis, where we have our experimental vineyard of hundreds or thousands of these grapevines today which essentially acts like a genetic library, if you will, of all of this DNA from 30 different grapevine species found in North America. There are many more hybrids than that between those species. And each cutting, or what we would call an accession that we, that we collect, comes back and is labeled. And then over the last several decades, when the Walker Lab has been researching um, different things like Pierce's disease or drought tolerance, we can screen tens to hundreds of these different grapevines in our collection and determine which ones are the most tolerant or resistant to these different stresses that are facing the industry. So in the past, yes, it's been drought tolerance, Pierce's disease and nematodes, but the project we'll be talking about today is the salt tolerant um, rootstock breeding program. And that's been going on for about 10 years in the Walker lab. I think this is a good time to share with you a story that Dr. Walker told me the other day, which was back in 1990, I think he said, and he said as if I should know exactly where this was, he was on the Texas Oklahoma border next to the Pease River and the Red River when he was walking through the forest, probably with one of his students. And one of the samples he collected that day was of a grapevine that was climbing up a tree in a gully in that area. And he brought that cutting back, hoping that it would contribute to the um, drought tolerant project here at Davis. Um, within the next year or two, we figured out it was not one of the top performers for the drought tolerance project. It was later screened for its ability to resist nematodes. It was also determined not to be a top performer. But that grapevine sat here in our experimental vineyard, again, acting like that library and 20 years later, in around 2010, it was screened for its ability to tolerate salts. And salts are starting to accumulate more in vineyard soils around the world, but closer to home here, they're an issue in California's Central Valley, especially the Southern part closer to Paso Robles. So it's something that our lab has been very interested in. And I am so excited to be joining this project today. Um, 10 years into this project, now having identified a vine that we think houses the genetic material to save vineyards on the most severely salt affected sites and maintain high quality wine and grape production on the growing number of moderately affected sites. So there are several people I would really like to thank because this is such an exciting time that I've been able and so fortunate um, to be involved with this project, including Dr. Walker. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And Chris Chen, his PhD student, who's given me so much time and support and will undoubtedly be one of the top experts in the field in salt tolerance. 
Um, and then some of their Dr. Walker's former graduate students who have worked tirelessly on this project, either developing assays so we can quickly screen hundreds of different um, vines in our collection for salt tolerance, that would be Kevin Fort. And then also Claire Heinz, who spent a lot of time traveling all over um, the Southern and the Midwestern states collecting samples for our collection in general, but also specifically for this salt tolerant project. There are also some other people in the lab um, who were very important in this research and have been for a very long time. Nina, who's standing right on my right, has been involved in the Walker Lab for many years and many of the methods we use to take cuttings and quickly grow healthy plants um, that allow our results to be very reproducible and precise. She developed many of those methods. And then to her right is Veronica. They work very closely together. And I honestly think without them and Chris, I would probably still be running around a vineyard with my shears right now, hoping that my cuttings would grow. And then to my left is Jorge. He's a senior undergraduate engineering student, um, possibly would like to be a winery engineer someday. And he's been doing a lot of the chloride analysis for all of these trials the last couple of years. So we'll talk about how salt affected soils form, where they exist specifically in some major wine regions, how salt affects grape vines physiologically, and then how we believe that we can couple precision irrigation and the development of salt tolerant rootstocks again to save vineyards on the most affected sites and maintain wine quality and production on the growing number of moderately affected sites. This is another story Andy told me and I and I thought it was really good I want to share with you. So 6,000 years ago the Sumerians lived in the Tigris and Euphrates river valleys down here near the Persian Gulf. And there were a number of different civilizations, but the Sumerians in particular were really skilled farmers. And this green area is called the Fertile Crescent. It's an amazing agricultural area back in the day. And you can kind of think of it like the Central Valley of California today. And no matter how incredible and fertile this land was like, the, like California Central Valley, we have to take care of our soils. And this is a great story of that. And we can learn from that right now. The Sumerians developed an elaborate system of irrigation canals. And every time they irrigated their vines, unbeknownst to them, there was some salt in that water. And that salt, because of the growing conditions being warm and dry, started to collect in the soil as pure water evaporated from the soil surface and pure water transpired from the plant. And over the course of 2000 years, that salt became so severe that they were forced to replant wheat with a more salt tolerant crop, barley. But eventually barley too suffered and could not support the populace. And historians believe today that this was part, salts concentrating in the soil and the degradation of the soil was part of what led to the fall of the Sumerian civilization and other civilizations within the Fertile Crescent. So salt has been an issue for a very long time and it continues to be an issue today, ever increasing so with climate change. All of the colored regions on this world map are affected by salt in their soils to some level of severity. They, these, all these colored regions tend to have growing conditions that are dry and warm. And we notice that some of the major wine producing regions are on this map, like Australia, parts of Spain, and that dark area in California. If we look at the legend, we see that that really dark area is sort of purplish. That means it's a combination of saline and sodic. Saline implies a chloride toxicity and sodium implies a sodium toxicity. And we'll talk a little bit about later how chloride and sodium affect grape production differently. But chloride is especially bad for the grape vine themselves, whereas sodium is really bad for the vineyard's soil structure. So if millions of acres are affected by salty soils worldwide, thousands of acres are affected by salty soils in California, including 29 to 43% of surface soils around Paso Robles, which is one of our state's 
greatest wine regions. That's according to the senior water management advisor for the entire University of California system. This map is showing temperature increases in California in the last 120 years. And we can see a lot of those increases are coming um, in the southern part of the state near the Central Valley. In combination with temperature increases, we've also had an irregular climate with a lot of long periods of drought. And that combination of heat and dryness um, can exacerbate salt accumulating in the soil. In the past, we would have been able to flood irrigate our fields, the picture on the left, with really high quality water. When I say high quality, I mean water that doesn't have a lot of solutes or salts in it. And that really, and that huge application of a lot of clean water was able to suppress salts below the rooting zone of these vines or other plants grown in the Central Valley. But today, due to increase in demands for water from municipal, um, industrial, and agricultural uses, we don't have enough water with our current climate and situation here in California to continue to flood irrigate. So we use modern drip irrigation. Modern drip irrigation has been an incredible tool because it's saved lots of water for the agricultural industry and um, our entire state as a whole. But um, modern drip irrigation can also lead to salts accumulating around the rooting profile of the plant. And in grapevines, which tend to grow in these very warm and dry conditions, it can get quite bad. And these are the symptoms of modern drip irrigation when not controlled um, well in these certain environments. So you get salt rings. Water comes out of the drip emitter. It then comes to the surface. It's either used by the plant and transpired, or it's evaporated from the soil and the salts are left behind in those white rings. Here's a cross-section look of what that would look like underneath the soil. Salts, you can see they're dotted and they're being concentrated around the rooting zone. So there's a couple things that we can do. Modern drip irrigation systems only in the last 20 years were thought to be on average 70% effective. That means that certain parts of the drip irrigation line were emitting more water than others. So we can continue to improve our drip irrigation systems, but also understand our vineyards better and be able to target certain areas of the vineyard at different um, drip emission rates, and then also apply that water when the vine actually needs it. And that's super important because we want that water to be used as quickly as possible so we lose less water to the environment. Because if that water contains solutes, including salts, if we apply more than the vine needs or is going to use at that time, we're essentially putting more water and, and more salts into our soil. Let's talk a little bit about how salty water is taken up by the plant and why the plant would ever want to take up salty water. In a normal soil, you're going from higher to a lower energy state. Water wants to go into the root cells because there's more solutes in those root cells. Thus, it's going to this higher energy state and eventually being transpired through the leaves. But in a really salty or dirty soil water solution, with a lot of solutes and salts, water actually does not want to go into the root cell. So the plant can do a couple things. It can produce non-toxic solutes, or it can take up salts from the soil water solution to lower its energy level. If it produces non-toxic solutes and moves them into the root cells, that uses a lot of energy for the plant. And in the situations we're talking about with drought and heat, and salt toxicity, the plant is probably very stressed out already and doesn't have the capacity to make those solutes. So the plant will in turn take up salts from the environment, which can become very toxic, especially in a grapevine that does not have a salt tolerant rootstock. So the plant will take up those salts, they'll start to accumulate, they'll enter the xylem stream and start to accumulate in the canopy, really hindering photosynthesis. In addition to that, you also get nutrient deficiencies. Before we mentioned saline or chloride and sodic or sodium issues in soils, chloride moves really readily into the soil and through the plant and becomes very toxic. Sodium messes up the soil 
but also some gets into the plant and both create other nutrient deficiencies. For example, sodium is about the same size and charge as potassium. So the plant can easily confuse sodium for potassium. And then you end up getting a potassium deficiency. Likewise, chloride is a very similar size and charge as nitrate. So you can end up having a nitrogen deficiency if you have excess chloride. What ends up happening over the course of minutes to hours, if we look on the right, is that as salts continue to build up in the plant, over the course of minutes to hours, the plant can look very dehydrated. And then over the course of days to weeks, can become very toxic. Again, nutrient deficiencies, photosynthetic systems shutting down. Finally, by weeks to months, the plant can possibly die. And part of the problem with, again, with salt is that it's hard to diagnose, is this a drought issue or is this a salt issue? And by the time you figure that out, it may be too late. You've done irreparable damage to the vine. Here's a picture of leaf burn. And this is what a bad case of salt toxicity in a vineyard looks like. And the photos on the right show you an up close image of what those leaves look like. Here we can differentiate sodium and chloride toxicity based on the leaf symptoms, whereas sodium you get marginal leaf burns, so a leaf burn around the edges of the leaf that works its way inward. And in chloride toxicity, you get leaf burn on one edge and it works its way across the leaf. So besides um, improving our drip irrigation systems and understanding our vineyards better and being able to apply uh, clean water um, when possible using our drip emitters, we can develop salt tolerant rootstocks. And there's a lot of different species, about 30 in North America, but only two or three are really prominent in most of the commercial grapevine rootstocks. So there's a lot of possible genetic material out there that we're not using that can not only help for salt tolerance, but could help with a lot of other um, abiotic and biotic stressors facing our industry. So, so, so breeding American rootstocks did not really happen mass scale until phylloxera. And the breeding occurred in the United States and France and other countries abroad. And again, they were primarily focused on riparian repestris. And still today, riparian repestris makes up a large, a large concentration of the genes in our rootstocks today. So a lot of these different species, these North American species, have not really been yet explored, and that's part of the mission of the Walker Lab um, rootstock breeding program. So after phylloxera had been contained by American rootstocks, even though a lot of these different commercial rootstocks were mainly made up of riparian repestris and sometimes berlandieri, people started to notice around the world like, hey, some of these rootstocks appear to be more drought tolerant than others or some are resisting fungal diseases better than others. And by the 1960s, people started realizing some of these commercial rootstocks seem to be more salt tolerant than others. So we get into this idea of using rootstocks to protect wine. This is an old study. So if, it if salt tolerance started to be talked about in the literature in the 1960s, in the 1980s, you started getting some good studies and figures. This figure is from around the time that our lab started the salt tolerance project. And it's looking at two different rootstocks. One that's thought to be, and these are commercial rootstocks. One that's thought to be a very good chloride excluder and one that's thought to be a very bad chloride excluder. The good chloride excluder is 140 Ruggieri or 140 RU. And the bad chloride excluder is K5140. And it's looking at root uptake of chloride versus leaf uptake of chloride at different chloride concentrations, 5, 10, 25. And this is a good time to note that an agricultural soil scientist would consider a soil with 40 millimoles of salt to be a salt affected soil. So even at the highest concentration tested in this study from 2011, we're only looking at a concentration of salt that's about half of what's considered a salt affected soil. And remember that map we looked at at the start, there are a huge portion of the world with moderate to severe affected soils. Anyways, 
if we look at the root chloride uptake of the bad performer K5140 and the good performer 140RU, we notice that neither one of them is very significant. In fact, they kind of go back and forth in which one is taking up more chloride into their roots. But if we look at the chloride concentration in the leaves, we notice there's a consistent, consistent difference that 140RU, the good excluder, is taking up less chloride into their leaves. And so our lab would look at some of these early studies around the time we started this project and think that, okay, there has to be some mechanism that salt is entering the roots, but it's not going up to the leaves in the good salt excluders. So we started doing a bunch of tests in our lab. And a lot of that, again, was done when Kevin Fort and Claire Heinz were here. And we started looking at some of these other theories about why this could possibly be happening. So again, here's the same two rootstocks in this model, 140RU, the bad excluder, and or, or the good excluder, and then K5140, the bad excluder, or we'll call it the chloride includer. So let's start by looking at K51. Chloride is, here it is in the soil solution. It enters the root through the epidermis cortex, and it is shuttled quickly through the xylem parenchyma, which surround the xylem into the xylem, and it is then brought up to the canopy of the plant. So the root stays pretty healthy because it doesn't have a lot of chloride in it ever. It just quickly moves it into the xylem and it goes and affects the plant and could kill the grapevine. But in the good chloride excluder, the root cell itself, the root cell itself actually isn't probably that healthy because it's capturing a lot of chloride. So it comes in from the soil solution here the vacuole in this case, in this model, it releases calcium, which binds to that chloride, preventing it from getting up into the xylem. And the chloride starts to concentrate in the parenchyma up until the point where there's so much chloride, the cell is no longer efficient or it becomes toxic in the root cell. So the rootstock can basically shed that root and grow another one, which is, and, and then the canopy never gets infected which is much better than in the alternative where we affect the canopy, but not the root cell. The picture on the bottom is a microscopic image that Chris Chen had taken. And this is a root and you can see some root hairs on the edge on that yellow line. And as we work our way inward, the xylem is right here in the center. And Chris says that those, he likes to say that the xylem parenchyma are essentially bodyguards to the xylem and they're, they're all around the xylem capturing chloride. So if we think about this system on an entire grapevine level, here's the bad excluder or the chloride includer, K5140, takes up a lot of um, nutrients and water through its root hairs. Those quickly make their way through the xylem parenchyma, right up in the xylem stream, affect um, the leaves and the fruit of the vine. And I think it's also worth noting at this point that salt in grapes, there's an increasing number of papers talking about how that can affect fermentation and that there's actually, and it's not good for your health either, which is why the Australian government has a legal concentration on the amount of salt that can be in juice. In the chloride excluder model, this is the really good excluder 140RU, that's a uh, popular commercial rootstock. Here we add xylem loading. So the chloride and or other minerals and water get through the root hairs into the cell but then are captured by the parenchyma before they can ever get up to the xylem stream so we can keep a happy scion and fruit well below the legal limit of chloride. So those are some of the early studies we looked at. Again, the Walker lab is really focused on um, collecting different material from different grapevine species around North America. On the right is the natural distribution of rupestris, which was one of those first like riparian rupestris were super helpful to solve the phylloxera crisis. They were really helpful because they were really rootable. So especially in the mid 19 in the mid 1800s, um, we could quickly solve the phylloxera epidemic because they rooted so well. And they were very nematode resistant. So here's the outline of rupestris. That's one of 30 species in North America. But if we made a map like this for each of the 30 species in North America, we would make a species richness map, which is on the left. And you can see the richness of the number of taxa is very similar in range to the natural range of rupestris. So since this project has started, Dr. Wal one of Dr. Walker's students, Claire Heinz, has taken a lot of trips um, to this region. 
This is also the area where Andy found that grapevine in 1990, which we call Vitus acerifolia 9018. And we've been testing them and screening them using some methods that his former student, Kevin Ford, came up with an assay where we could quickly screen rootstocks for salt tolerance very reliably and efficiently. And we continue to reproduce the same results. Here's one of the earliest tests that his lab did on a number of these wild species. We can see that about a dozen of the species were tested, including 105 separate plants or sessions from our collection. About a quarter of them were suspected hybrids. Here's the key, a little over half of them were excluders. It's also worth noticing that even within some of these species that are thought to be very drought or salt tolerant, some are very salt or drought tolerant, or in this case, chloride resistant within the species, but others are not. So Vitus Arizonica, 47 were tested, but um, only 26 were thought to be chloride excluders. So this is one of the early figures that Chris Chen, who's the current PhD student, was looking at. And these grapevines, I believe, were tested at 25 millimoles, similar to um, the earlier studies by other labs around the world for salt tolerance. And Chris noticed that 9018 was the top performer. So he wanted to test 9018 again, but at different salt concentrations. Because before all the research was looking at 25 millimoles, which is about half of what's considered a, a saline soil. So this time Chris looked at 25 millimoles of, of sodium chloride, 75 and 100, which is two and a half times the concentration of a salt affected soil and then the control which had a zero amount of salt. So he took our top performer, the one we're really excited about in our lab, Vitus acerifolia 9018. And if we look at its chloride buildup over these extreme salt concentrations, 25 to 75 to 100, it actually doesn't build up that much salt compared to the control, and especially compared to some of the other top performers on the commercial market, like 110R and 140RU. He noticed that somewhere between 25 and 75 millimoles of sodium chloride, that the grapevine could no longer handle it. And there was some major separation between our nine, Vitus acerifolia 9018 and these top performers on the commercial market. He also took this in this same study, used a LICOR, which was measuring photosynthesis on these plants, and could also determine that photosynthetically for their controls, just receiving water, there were no differences between 9018 and any of these other rootstocks. But when you increase salt concentration, there were significant differences, somewhere between 25 and 75 millimoles. So then he wanted to make sure that 9018 was the most chloride um, tolerant grapevine in our collection here at Davis. So he looked at a lot of the top performers that Kevin and Claire had studied and determined again that Vitus acerfolia 19 was one of the top performers. And you can see that he used 75 millimoles. So at the top of that range where you think that, where he thought there was some sort of separation between the commercial rootstocks and the top performing um, wild grapevine species. So a lot of our research now is stuck with 9018 since this trial. And we're looking at lower salt concentrations around 50, so just above what's considered a salt affected soil. And those are the studies I'll talk about today, where we're comparing 9018 to some of the really popular salt tolerant rootstocks on the market. The last thing I would like to point out before we talk about the research and the results today is that chloride or salt tolerance is a very complicated um, gene genetically. There is no one gene, or we think, in grapevines, and this proves that. So we cross 9018, very good salt excluder with GRN3, an incredible nematode resistant plant, but a mediocre salt excluder. And we produce 77 offspring. This is just a small collection of those offspring. And what you see is, is that the root tissue, there's no significant difference in the amount of chloride taken up by the roots. And that was to be expected by some former studies in other labs. But in the leaf tissue, there was a major significant difference. Vitus acerifolia 19 took up way less chloride in its leaves. And there was continuous variation 
among 77 different samples. Again, this is just a small population of those. What that tells us is that there's not one single on-off switch for salt tolerance. There's a huge number of genes and our lab isn't necessarily super focused on figuring out all of those separate genes. We're trying to make the most salt tolerant rootstock so we can immediately get something to the marketplace because grape growers in certain areas of the world like California want salt tolerant rootstocks. Which brings us into our research comparing um, the most salt tolerant rootstocks on the market to 9018. And first I'll talk about our methods. Again, these methods um, were produced by Nina and Kevin Fort and other people in our lab about 10 years ago for us to be able to quickly screen hundreds of rootstocks in our collection here. So we take cuttings, those cuttings go into a fog room for about two weeks. Again, thanks so much to Nina. She's come up with a lot of these methods which make this a very effective and reproducible process. And then we pot these cuttings um, and that material in those pots is called fritted clay. And it's the same type of material that's used on baseball fields. And that clay is really important and was a very important step in coming up with this assay because again, we're using sodium chloride to, to tr stress test the salt tolerance of these vines. And sodium again can affect the soil and break up clay, clay particles and make the soil impermeable to water. So this very granular uh, fritted clay will allow water to be very permeable in these clay pots throughout any like harvest period. So we use that and that clay also has an abundance of potassium in it. So we're not concerned about getting a potassium deficiency. So we mix water with has essential nutrients using a Hoagland solution, which has been around a very long time and then mix that with salt for our studies and then our control, it's just the Hoagland solution. So just the nutrients and water. We then select different plants um, for our experiment and then we lay them out nicely on these tables so they get adequate amount of sunlight and everything is randomized for statistical purposes. Finally, we used in our first experiment, a Lycor machine, which measured the photosynthetic capability of all these different plants. And I would really like to thank Chai T and Gabriella, who were students under Dr. Forrestal and Dr. Bartlett, and also thank those professors for lending us um, their resources. And then after we would use the Lycor machine, we would separate the roots, clean them out to get all the fritted clay away from them and the leaves those would go into dry storage to prepare them for chloride analysis, which again, Jorge, thank you, was, it was working on that. And this is using a chlorodometer with silver ion titration and cold water extraction. The cold water is really important. So we're really gentle on our, on our samples. All right, let's get into the results. So the first experiment looked at five genotypes, so five separate species. 9018 are wild grapevine species, three very popular commercially available salt tolerant rootstocks, and then one really bad um, salt tolerant commercially variable rootstock. And we used 50 millimoles. There were six or seven replicates. Um, so for each harvest period, there were six in the first experiment. Each experiment uh, and harvest had six or seven replicates that would receive salt per genotype and six or seven that would receive water. Here is the root chloride uptake of these separate five separate genotypes. It looks very messy and it should. That's exactly what we were expecting. Again, based on those other results by our lab and other labs, roots take up lots of chloride and there's no trend for the really good excluders to the bad excluders, we expect them all to take up a lot of salt into their roots. The next slide we'll look at is what happens to the chloride concentrations in their leaves. And again, we're hoping that 9018 doesn't take up that much chloride in its leaves because it's keeping it in its roots. So let's see if we can get a nice trend. And that's exactly what we see in this experiment. This is so cool because a lot of people in this lab you know, do a lot of work to put these things together. And it's really awesome when you get results like this. 9018 is only taking up a little bit of salt over this one month harvest period. 
That one month harvest period is consistent with a lot of our tests over the last 10 years. In between, we have some of the really popular rootstocks on the market for salt tolerance, that being 140RU, um, Ramsey, and 1103P. 1103P is really widely planted in California. Um, the California system has said it has medium salt tolerance, but if you look at some of the major nurseries in California, they will say it has medium to high salt tolerance. So we thought it was really important to include it in our um, experiments at this stage. And then 4453 is taking up a lot of salt, significantly different from 9018. Here's the same figure, just a line graph, shows 9018 only taking up a little bit of chloride. So then we did one more experiment last fall. We only selected three out of the five of these genotypes. We selected 9018, the one we're studying, 1103, the one most widely planted in California, and then 4453. We did this in order to have more replicates than before. So we have more space available, more plants. We had nine replicates. There was only one harvest period. And here's the root uptake chloride of chloride. We can see that the control, this black area where there was zero millimole treated in those nine replicates, all very similar. No significant differences between the best chloride excluder and the worst. At 50 millimoles, again, no significant differences. They all took up a lot of chloride. But now let's look at the leaves again and see if we can get the same trend as the first experiment. And we do, 9018 took up by far the least chloride. 1103P, very widely planted popular rootstock, and also a pretty good salt performer on the commercial market, took up somewhere in between that and the really bad one, 4453. So um, we think that, these, that this shows that 9018 has really incredible uh, genetic material and we hope that this rootstock and others that we may discover through these tests uh, will be able to, again, save vineyard acreage in California that's that has really severe salt toxicity issues and the growing number of acreage in California and abroad with moderate um, severe to salt toxicity issues. From here, uh, this is a, a picture of a trial that's going on right outside the greenhouse. And it's using the same rootstocks that we just used in those trials that I discussed, except Cabernet Sauvignon is attached to this as a scion. So the idea here is then to, it's a little bit longer, it's a multi-year study, but to verify that there's no salt accumulating in the grapes. In concert with this, um, real plantings and real vineyards are, are, are ongoing. So this is a really exciting time to be part of this project when we're sort of a, establishing this plant through the greenhouse trials and moving it into the field. I'd like to thank the American Vineyard Foundation, the California State Fair, and the Wine Spectator for their support, and also a number of people um, who have been super supportive and really inspirational, or really inspirational on my wine journey, um, including UC Davis, the professors, the, my classmates here, this has been so much fun. And finally, I want to say to Dr. Walker, um, he was retiring this summer. I'm sure he'll still be very involved. But the work that you're doing um, in your lab and the work that I feel so privileged to be having a part of is you're allowing, like, this is a picture of central Wisconsin. I've thought about planting a vineyard in the Midwest since I was pretty young, but there's a lot of challenges. And the work that your lab has been doing allows people like me to maybe someday improve the quality and uh, of wine that we can produce sort of on the fringes of what's possible using natural ways of finding North American rootstocks and breeding them so we can make wine in areas before that may have not been possible or improve our productivity and quality of wines that sort of has in areas where there's a lot of abiotic and biotic stresses that make it very challenging like this site. Okay, that is, thanks Dave, that was great. Uh, we all are inspired now to rush to Wisconsin and get cheap soil and put vineyards in. <laughs> Cheaper soil, I guess. Are there some questions out there? <laughs> 
Dave, I uh, wanted to ask on that one graph, the 9018, the one with the different colors. I don't like trying to describe which one it was, but I'm going to go back. It had a very tight, yeah, it had the, the mean and the variability was very tight and as opposed to some of the other rootstocks. Do you have any thoughts on why that might have been? Uh, for 9018? Yeah, the 9018, and then, you know, you look at Ramsey, the wide range, and same thing for some of the other ones, 1103P towards the higher end has a higher variability. Did you guys, was it just a result of not as many trials with that, or I don't know? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. I'd actually noticed before we started these trials that um, through other trials in the lab, our lab has noted that Ramsey specifically has very variable salt concentrations and I think Dr. Walker would be the best person to answer that. Um, but, you know, perhaps we don't know why, but also like they might just grow very differently at different rates. There could be an issue with that. Um, all of the vines in this experiment, we would prepare them for a month before we would start salt treatment and they were all of the same size, same health. Um, so Ramsey is, yeah, it's one of those interesting things. It's been used for a long time. People thought it was a ex really good salt excluder but now we kind of understand that salt tolerance and drought tolerance are two separate things. And so Ramsey is exceptional at drought tolerance, but maybe medium to like pretty good at salt. I should also mention that the, the goal is not necessarily that 9018 becomes the most widely planted rootstock in salt affected <laughs> soils in California. Um, the goal is that we can show what's possible with this uh, wild material and that we could someday breed 9018 into a very popular rootstock like 1103P. And you can back cross it. So you can essentially take the really salt tolerant genes of 9018 and mix them with all the incredible things that a rootstock like 1103P can offer. More questions? Answer that very well, Dave. So I have to jump in and complain. Actually, Ramsey's only claim to fame in terms of salt resistance is it's 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 a false name, which is Salt Creek. It's an incorrectly named uh, uh, Salt Creek occasionally, and but it had nothing to do with salt resistance. Curiously, I'll go back one figure too. There was something I want to point out too. Here's the root accumulation, and there's an upward trend. But then on our last harvest point, um, all of the Rootstocks take up less chloride in their roots. Um, I don't. I don't think this was just. We think most likely this had to do something to do with another trial that was happening right near this table in the greenhouse that may have just partially shaded this table. So that's the reason I we think that the uh, chloride concentration in the roots went down at that last harvest point. More questions. Hey, Dave, this is super awesome and congrats. Um, maybe this is an Andy question, but I was wondering if there's any inclination about what this might mean across uh, several years and kind of salt accumulation in the vines and kind of planning how you would replant and if that's a consideration. Do you want to answer that, Dave? I can pitch in if you like, or after you finish, I'll pitch in. Uh, I only I only got part of that, Josh, because I was trying to get rid of my screen share. <laughs> I'm happy. Do you mind? Do you mind just telling me the the end of that? Yeah. So it's kind of basically like, what does this mean for a vine across several years as far as salt tolerance? Oh. And thank you. Yeah, that's a really great question. So. <clears throat> I guess there's two different ways you can you can do these studies. You can have lower salt concentrations and you know test them over a number of period of years, which some studies have done in the field too. Or what our lab has done to really stress them is just to jack up the salt concentration. And we think it's kind of telling you the same thing. So you could do a longer study or you can just make a super high salt concentration. And that one figure, I don't know if you recall where Chris had looked at 25, 75 and 100 millimoles sodium chloride, that puts a lot of stress on the vines and 9018 like hardly went up from really zero to 100 in that case. 
but compared to some of the other top uh, commercial root stocks, they did go up significantly between that 25 and 75 millimoles. And that's why we're trying to, instead of staying at 75, even though there was a lot of separation between 90, 18 and the top performers on the commercial market, we're trying to lower the salt concentration that we're doing these studies at to make it really close in line with what's considered a, a, a salt affected soil. And the other thing we ignore when we're doing these tests is the fact that sodium has a huge impact as well. So over time at high concentrations, the sodium disrupts the soil, the structure and really prohibits um, uptake of water in that sense too. So it, it can be tricky to, to run these things uh, in the field at, at the same level, safe concentration. So the, the information doesn't necessarily um, translate into a field situation beautifully. <laughs> Hopefully it, it, it um, uh, brings out certain points and, and we'll have to go back and fine tune the sodium portion later on. Well, thank you so much everyone for coming. I know it's a few minutes past. Thank you for staying and um, look forward to seeing you all here. That was a great talk. Thanks, Dave. We'll give you a virtual okay, great talk. Congratulations. Well done. <clears throat>